So it's just like, if you're in entertainment, you have to educate yourself about the business. And the first education you get, how the hell do I make money? Especially if you're a music artist. Yeah. Or you'll never make money. You could have a platinum album, but if you haven't set that <laughs> stuff up, ain't nobody could collect royalties for you. Oh. In that same client, we, we only found out that a song was written 20 years after the fact because someone tried to license it. And I looked in the client's catalog and it wasn't there. So I'm like, her husband never registered it. I called up the performing rights organization. They're like, we could only go back nine months for 20 years of royalties. And when I pulled that song on the web, it had re been remixed a million times. And guess what? No one contacted us because it wasn't in our catalog. I was shocked these people actually found us. Because so what do people do in that case? Them. If they wrote a song and they don't, as you said, license it or anything, they just don't make the money and the other people who remix their songs, I guess they earn whatever they earn and they'll have to think about whoever wrote it. Pretty much because if you don't, okay, so this is like, if you create music in the US, you need to do a couple things so people know, like, this is my song, okay? You register it with a copyright office. So now it's a public record. And then to collect your money, copyright office is not collecting your money. It's actually just protecting your music, okay? It gives you a level of protection. Um, so you could sue people. Because in the U.S., if you want to sue someone for copyright infringement, your copyright has to be actually registered, okay? And then to, for you to get money on said music, you need to affiliate with a performing rights organization in the U.S. It's ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and around the globe, like Canada has their own, so, so can, and Europe have we their have own. We have PCO in the region, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. They collect the royalties. As you were saying, Dr. Martin, about they were trying to go now and think it's like, oh, let's try to collect royalties so when someone was playing the music or showing the show, something like that. So the music people will collect the royalties. But there is, when you register there in the way how the U.S. music works, the royalty stream is split. Because back in the day, if you're a songwriter, they had to split the money in two because the publisher was screwing over the songwriters and not giving them their portions of the royalties. So the performing rights organization, when they were formed, took it upon themselves to say, we are going to split the royalties in two. And if you wrote a song and, okay, so the publisher, think about a publisher as a person that's supposed to be out there as a songwriter. Because back then, a lot of songwriters weren't singers. They were just writing the song. And then the publisher was the person that was going out to find the artist to sing the song so then the songwriter could make money. Mm -hmm. And they used to be screwing over the songwriters. So they came up with this thing where the performing rights organization cut the royalties in two and say, you will pay half the royalties directly to the songwriter and half to the publisher. So if you're indie and you're independent self-publishing, but you don't create a publishing entity to go along with what you're doing, you're only going to collect half your royalties because they need a publisher to pay the other half to. It's quirky, but that's just how it works in music. And so then, but then you have to tell them the songs in your catalog because if they don't know, they can't collect. And once it's there, if someone is out there running your music, even though you haven't done all those things, you have to now run to go register your copyright and then you sue them for copyright infringement because um, you're putting out your music. And a lot of people do this in music. They put their music out without actually setting up the infrastructure so their music could be. And they're like, yeah, monetize my music. And I had this discussion with my kids in class earlier this semester, you know, they're all music majors. That's who I was teaching. And a lot of them been gigging and they were writing their own stuff. And I asked my student, okay, so who's your PRO? And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? And then I told him, he's like, yes, okay, I have one. Have you, like, what's in your catalog? Did you give them your catalog? No. How can they collect your money if they don't know what songs that you wrote? So it's a steps and process. And I think that a lot of people don't necessarily educate themselves. Again, a lot of people want to be in this business, but come in this business really buying and are lazy as hell to go try to educate and read the books and figure it out. They just know they want to become a star and they want to be famous. And you get to that level and you make a bunch of money, you are going to be broke. 
and you are going to be as you're going to be like the broke artists we all know to hear about that were stars and got to the height of the industry and now ain't got a penny. My okay. favorite, my favorite line is from White Chicks. What do you mean? Um, when you say broke, um, MC Hammer broke or Martha Stewart broke? And he's like, MC Hammer broke. <laughs> bro, bro, you ain't got no money. <laughs> so you know, it's just. And um, one last thing I'm going to say to you, when I was saying about forming your trade organization, I am dead serious. Yeah, you guys in the region could say, oh, we don't have this and we don't have that and we don't have the resources. You don't have it, you build it, okay? No, like I got, a, like I quit my job in 2007. The American economy went into a deep, but like deep recession. Wow. Guess who were the first people to go? The lawyers. <laughs> The expendable expense, okay? I can just sit around and wait for the country to write itself to try to get into entertainment. I created my own avenue. I sheltered onto this bad boy like nobody business. I have used Mason Firm to open doors to me. When I stepped into the room, I stepped into the room as the owner of this firm. I didn't show up as L. Doni Mason. I showed up at L. Doni Mason of Mason Firm LLC. I came with power. It don't matter if my company was little and a company of one. I showed up with the power you think I was coming with 100 people behind me. I use this company to open doors, create leverage, and multiple opportunities. You don't have a trade group? Start one and start reaching out to people through your events. And don't show some tacky ass event either. If you're not going to put up the money to do the thing right, don't do it. Because it's just going to look tacky and cheap and just crappy. You form the organization, you form your own trade group, you sit down and you think about it and you don't rush to market, okay? You set it up, you figure out what you want it to look like, what the vibe you're trying to give, what the level of professionalism, and then you start hosting events and not the dinky crap. Okay, it has to be a certain ambience at a certain location because now you're trying to build the brand. All right, and by doing that, then you use that to then leverage and open doors. And then you say, Okay, you start in the region, then you do your research in the region. Who are our local entertainers? Who are our people doing things like try to start establishing in the region so you know your people will come to your stuff before you start reaching out to the US and start bringing those people in, especially if you want a certain level of people, you better start establishing some stuff here, right. And then you do that. So everything that you don't have, it doesn't mean that you can't have it. You just have to create it. <coughs> if you need to use what, like certain things in America as template, then use them and then make them your own. Like all the performing rights organization, it's not like they were always there. Someone had to start it. They started it because songwriters were getting mistreated. You know, it's like, you don't have it, you build it. And then 13 for me, like 13 years later, this is what I've had. And that company has been good to me. Okay. Yeah. It might not have made me the billions and billions of dollars, but guess what? It got me to move forward in my career to like a certain level where when I said I do litigation for the biggest company in the world right now, I mean the biggest company. Yes, that one. And I'm saying it's like, I just did not get there. And then again, you have to remember, like, we are minority people. We have all kind of strikes going on, oh. right? So we got to be super creative and we got to have, like, a million things on top of a million. You know what stuff I had when I went <laughs> to, like, connect with that law firm that I do, uh, you know, like a part-time thing with? I was coming with, like, years of experience and, like, so much stuff, like, it was insane, my resume at that point. When I went there, I got hired in like two half an hour interviews. I never saw these people that hired me until I went to the office and meet people for the first time. I had two half an hour phone calls. But that's what it is. When you build your own and you get to that point, you cannot be denied. So instead of sitting around going like, oh, we don't have this and we don't have, create it. Because 10 years from now, it could be huge. If there is no reason in the region 
in Antigua and in like the Caribbean region, we can't have a thriving entertainment, um, you know, community. Mm -hmm. I just remember growing up, we had Oliver and it was hilarious, right? But it's just like, we don't have the passion or want to put in the work to build something. And it's no reason why our people are immensely talented. This artist I have illustrated in my book, it's immensely talented. You need to create it and you need to, no matter if you start small. When I started my business, man, I didn't have any events. There was no Grammys. There was no BAFTA TV awards in London. There was no red carpet. There was no designer, fashion designer that designed my gowns custom now. There was none of that, okay? <laughs> there was like none of that. There was me going to the store, buying something off the rack and just like, hope it looks great. Um, and that's what I'm saying. But I had to start somewhere and I am, you know, truly blessed and humbled by my beginnings. And I'm not knocking my humble beginnings when I started with like nothing to when I call up my client and go like, when can I stop by the boutique? Okay, cool. You know, and I step out and then I get the whole glam squad going and I step out and do that because I know it's years of doing that, right? Like years of small buildups and incremental steps and building on the other and the other. And I created it when no one would give it to me and I created my own destiny, right? My new company is called Predestined Media. You, right. you kind of get why it's that. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Um, next time we have a conversation, I don't want to hear, oh, we don't have this and we don't have that. And then you build out other trade groups from that. There is no reason. There's like, no, it's such like an annoying word. It's not like you can't, you can't and you will, but you have to be creative and you just got to do it. So I'm done with my soapboxing. I am literally getting hungry and it's been two and a half hours. <laughs> it has been awesome. And I do tend to preach sometime and get on my soapbox uh, because I know I literally started, like I left Antigua with that man. Like with my little suitcase and my Bible and like a thousand dollars, you know, it's wow. like, um, I know that's how I left home with that in a dream. And my daddy was here. It, it was just like, I had to figure out how did I go, you know, how did I get into school since I was going to be the first person to go to college out of my family in not knowing anything and like yellow pages were still, still a thing in the 90s uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> going through the yellow pages and just and the no cell phones you know like picking up the phone at home and like uh is there a way i could come visit your school and how does that work and they're like yeah there's something called out the house i'm like what is that and when like when is it it's like going through all that but in my mind, I knew exactly what I wanted and I wasn't going to take no for an answer and mediocrity is not in my vocabulary. I like the fancy life. Um, and I'm willing to work to get it. So it's all that. Okay, if I can do that and get here and leave home to come to like America and get there, you guys in Antigua could like figure something out. There's like no reason. You didn't have to deal with like racism and all the crazy stuff for being a black person in like a country full of like people that don't look like you. Because when you grow up in the Caribbean, we are so sheltered. 